Welcome to Javelin Journeys. I'd say good morning, but it means nothing depending on where you are in the world. And the network that I've built is nothing short of internationals. Hello, wherever you are in the world. This is episode eight of Javelin Journeys. I've been a little bit inconsistent with when I've put these out, just purely around time frames and things going on in the world. But I've never had a guest on the show. Today's guest, Chris Walker, if you don't know him, he's the CEO at Refine Labs. A very big figure in the industry of marketing, in my eyes, and one of the top voices on LinkedIn. I left, as many of you will know, my previous career after 15 years, about three years ago. It was just as COVID was kicking in, March 2020. And probably about three or four weeks into my new job, while I was trying to figure out how to use LinkedIn, my CEO sent me one of your posts. Um, <laughs> And I thought, do you know what? This guy's talking common sense here. Like it seems to make more sense than a lot of the drivel I'm seeing here on LinkedIn. And you've never stopped sharing value since that day, Chris. Whilst I don't want to give you too big of a head coming onto the show, you have very much inspired what I've done in and around LinkedIn. And still to this day, I send your posts to people and it changes their world in terms of how they think about market and how they think about business and how they think about revenue in general. Because let's be honest, you're a big proponent of all three being stitched together, right? It would be great if you could just share with us just for a couple of minutes your a little bit of your background and your story, how you came to be where you are for people who might not know who you are. Paul, thanks for the intro. Also really happy to help. One of the reasons why I make so much content is because it makes me really happy when people take the advice and get promoted, start their company, be successful, send me a note and say thank you are able to get that breakthrough idea. It's something that I wish that I had a lot more of when I was younger in my career. I felt like I had to figure out a lot on my own. Really awesome to hear that success story. And congrats for you starting the new podcast and getting everything going. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a basically consider myself an entrepreneur and a B2B marketer. I did B2B marketing, product management, operations, demand gen, and some sales for more than 10 years in-house before I started my company. And then I've started my company and I've through consulting agreements and other things like that, I've been able to work with more than 250 B2B SaaS companies in the past four years, which through that work over the past four years has given me a view of the market that is incredibly unique. I think that I've seen more Salesforce instances and work with more CMOs than anyone in the world at this point over the past four years. And through that repetition, I see a lot of patterns. I see where companies are doing the same thing and are it's not working. When they look at the data this way, they see the exact same thing. When they collect leads this way, they win them at the same rate. The challenges they face with sales and marketing alignment, all the root causes are the same. And because I've seen that over and over with companies, I'm able to then recognize, hey, there's something going wrong here. I talk to enough people and get enough feedback to understand why is it happening and then the third step is I'm able to actually work with companies directly to solve them, solve those issues, and then create frameworks and operating models around them so that other companies can adopt them as well. And so that's effectively what I do at my company. I recognize patterns, I assess root causes, I create solutions and prove them out with companies, and then I'm able to create frameworks that are able to be replicated by a lot of people. And that is general scientific principles. That's how we advance medicine. That's how we create life-changing drugs. That's how we have, have cancer survival rates be in some cases like above 90% now, where it used to be 30%. That is called using science and data to recognize patterns and make better decisions and advance it. And I believe that cr manufacturing revenue for B2B companies and B2C companies for that matter can be down, made down to a science using data, standardized mechanisms, overall systems views so that we can create conclusions that push the industry forward. So that's what I, that's what I really enjoy about it. And that's where I'm focused right now. It's fantastic. I haven't worked three years in the data science and analytics industry myself. I've seen the difference that understanding the raw data and the root causes as a result that can have on business performance and the, discovering the unknown unknowns, which people wouldn't otherwise think to connect is really powerful. My audience here at Javelin's probably a small chunk behind where your usual target audience is, Chris. I'm probably aimed more at those who are just beyond the startup phase where they're starting to gain some revenue, but they're not really at Series A yet, or maybe they're just about ready for Series A. So one of, one of, my, one of my questions for you at the very beginning of all this is, 
Why is stock social so important to get right in the early days, in your view? First off, I think regardless of like my company's ideal customer profile or the companies that we choose to work with, the advice that I give are basic business and marketing fundamentals and are applicable to any company of any stage, whether you have five employees, one employee, 500 or 5,000, whether you've raised a trillion dollars or zero dollars. I think that a lot of the things that I talk about and why people resonate with them is because they're right and they're fundamental concepts that have been proven over a long period of time. The tactics change, what we do on LinkedIn, how we run a Facebook ad, what are we supposed to do with our like event, this new technology, the tactics change, but the underlying strategy is, has been very consistent for decades. And so inside of the tactics, one of the things that we've, and if you think about strategy, if you really understood your ICP, you would have seen this three to five years ago minimum is the rise of what we call dark social. Through the scale and the maturity of the internet, B2B buyers and B2B buyer, B2C buyers, for that matter, have been able to figure out ways to access their peers, which they trust more than other sources of information to decide what to purchase, what technologies to use, what business priorities to solve, et cetera, which vendors to use in certain categories, et cetera, et cetera. When in 2012, they didn't have access. They didn't know who their colleagues were. They only saw them once a year at the conference. They didn't have a Twitter or a Facebook group to go into or a community on Slack. So what did they do when they needed to make a decision? They had to ask their colleagues what they thought or search in Google for a blog. That was effectively what was available for information 10 years ago. Now, when someone needs to figure out what business problem to solve, or maybe they've identified the business problem, now they need to figure out how am I going to solve this, they no longer go to Google as much. And instead, they will text inside of a CMO community and they'll ask a bunch of people and get a bunch of feedback. They'll text their network of female CMOs that they trust or just the people that they've worked with before. They will go to LinkedIn and post a poll or they will ask a question or they will ask a thought leader in the comments or they'll come on to one of my live events and ask their actual question. And they're still making the search, but the way that they do it is accessing direct peers that they trust more than a random blog that they get in Google. Part of that is Google's fault as the information there has become entirely commoditized but often, but I don't think it's really that. I think it's that we have access to better information that we trust more now. And now that we know how to use it, we're going to primarily use that. And so dark social can also not only include general word of mouth, like in a, asking a question in a community or posting a comment inside of LinkedIn, but it can also be that because of the other things that you've liked in the TikTok algorithm, that the TikTok algorithm then serves you my content. Or that you go into a podcast and you're able to search it. The main reason we call it dark social is because it doesn't get tracked by attribution software and it doesn't create account level intent data. So therefore, by most B2B measurement and attribution systems, it just effectively didn't happen. Um, and I think that drives a lot of improper strategy decisions when they use flawed data like that. And why is it so important to your business? Because if you went out and surveyed your top 100 accounts and all the people that work in those accounts about where they discover things and things like that, you'd get all the things that I just said. And it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Listen to your customers and follow what they say, not necessarily in product development, but what their preferences are to buy things 100%. Um, and so I could get more granular and detailed and technical about why, but the reality is that your customers are using these things to make decisions about what you sell and therefore you should be there. And I, and it's a huge competitive advantage to actually be there. And people ask me a lot because I get a, the once in a while comment of Chris, you're on LinkedIn, you're renting your audience. It's better to build an owned audience, blah, 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 blah. Stop renting on LinkedIn, build your email list. And I go back to them and say every time, there's no fucking way my company would be this big right now. If, and you know for sure that you wouldn't know me if I was blogging and sending emails. Then instead, LinkedIn, LinkedIn and podcast, it's entirely true. Whenever I say that, I never get a comment back because it is true. And the reality is that we need to think like that as B2B professionals. And as marketers and business professionals, we should be looking for the highest leverage activities to get the most ROI. And the reality is that using these types of channels, regardless of how they show up in your attribution model, these types of things drive the highest impact for B2B buyers today when we look at revenue and ROI. Would you say that it's less well adopted because it's a little bit harder to crack where leads have come in from as a result. If you're talking to somebody that's coming through your website, 
I know that they've probably viewed my posts five or six times over the last six months. Then they've hit my website, then they've filled in the form and then they've come to me. That's not as easy to track. Certainly as you start to become a larger company, that's not as easy to track as, well, the lead clicked on an advert, which tracked to the analytics. So I can see that came from there and therefore we can attribute that correctly. That's easier to manage. Therefore, that's the way most businesses work. And that's core to what you talk about a lot, isn't it? It's, it's not really easier. It's just that you don't measure it based on what you do today. Instead of looking at the exact same dashboard about your UTM parameters or what your visible report says, you could just ask the customer on the forum how they heard about you. And then they would say, I love your CEO's LinkedIn post. I see it all the time. I saw your CEO speak at this event. Your v VP of customer success posts great content on LinkedIn. And I show up to your weekly events every week. You would get the exact same information and you could display it in the exact same way, but B2B companies don't do it. And so it's not that it's harder to track. It's just needs to be tracked differently than how companies do it today. I think that's like the core main thing. There's another underlying belief here that I think people need to challenge, which is that like tracking these types of things should be automated and easy. And the decisions that we make out of them should be obvious and easy. And the reality is that the best strategy decisions come when you process a lot of primary customer research and then you process it in your brain and you come back with a strategy that AI or some other company wouldn't put together because they didn't get the customer insights. And the fact that most companies' attribution systems involve zero, zero insights that come directly from their customers is a huge problem. And so what I'm pioneering to people, because I've seen it work in my career and my business and all the companies that we work for, is that when you get insights from customers about how to drive your marketing strategy overall, not just develop your product, you are far more effective in what you do and you're far more decisive around the things that you invest in. And so I think that's the major unlock here is that we think about attribution of let's put some software tool in the background and make assumptions around the data that it collects. And why wouldn't we instead just go directly to our customers and confirm or refute that data? And that's a really valid point in that I hear a lot of marketing leaders saying that they, they, they measure the metrics they do because that's what they're expected to measure. And that's what's in their key performance indicators themselves. And it's with your approach, with a scientific approach, with a data backed approach, there's no refuting that evidence, which brings marketing back to being a science, which it can be if you're doing it right, rather than just a punt in the dark, which is where a lot of businesses seem to end up. Could I drop real quick? Another part of the tracking that I think is super important is that the tracking, like the way that it's done today, works perfectly if you are running in a lead generation assembly line where marketing gets leads, SDRs call them, and then sales tries to close whatever meetings that they get. The tracking around it works perfectly. I go into companies and I look at their data every time. And even if the data sucks, you can still see what's working and what's not. The challenge is that when you try and break out of just having your marketing team be a lead gen farm, like it was in 2012 and shouldn't be here anymore, but you keep the same measurement and attribution system around it, you prevent them from doing the things like posting on LinkedIn, making the podcast, being parts of the communities, maybe even starting a community. There are so many things that marketing teams can't do because the metrics are around whether the company says we're getting leads or not, the metrics force lead and attribution force lead generation. If you are running a lead generation system, then keep doing this thing and use that data around lead gen to make good strategic decisions and it would work fine. When you try and move to a model that has demand creation, demand capture and demand conversion in an all bound integrated revenue team, you can no longer use this type of system or attribution. It can be a part of it. It can give you some insights, but you can't use it 100%, which is what a lot of companies still try to do. Good lead on from that then. It's a nice segue into, there's a lot of smaller businesses who are in the process of growing right now, and they're worried about making some of these mistakes. They're trying to figure out what their marketing team is going to look like trying to figure out what their strategy is going to be. And they know that the decisions they make right now are probably the most crucial they're going to make in terms of setting them up for success in the future. What in your own words, what would you say would be the biggest change that a smaller business could make right now that will impact their future progress in this sort of aspect? 
Like, what can they do differently now that will pay them dividends in the future? Having the CEO prioritize marketing as much or more as they do product development and sales right now. That's it. Uh, if you ask a founder, and most almost every founder is doing founder sales to a millionaire. Almost every founder or some co-founder is deeply involved in the product development. And then how do they treat marketing? Oh, let's just go hire a VP of marketing for our Series A company. We just raised that a million bucks. Let's go get a VP of marketing. And it's clear that the business leaders inside of that company do not prioritize marketing inside of their own brain. And if they did, it would fundamentally change the growth trajectory of their company because 10 years ago, the, where, the way that you grew sales, aka dis sales distribution and product, and in the future, it's actually go to market and product. And so and when we think about go to market, the founders need to be thinking about customer success, sales and marketing together, not just sales alone. And that's really the fundamental difference. And if the co-founders and co-founders thought differently, the, who they hired would be different, what they did on a daily basis would be different how they measured it would be different. And I think for an early stage company, like that's, if I was going to be an investor in companies, that's one of the main things I would look for as a founder that really gets and understands marketing and prioritizes it. It's just how people buy today. We need to think about it as one of the primary growth levers in a company now. Yeah. And I guess from a marketing perspective, being able to think outside of the box, right? Not just following the norms and traditions, but thinking about what works for you, your business and your customers more than anything else yeah and it's i don't it's not even whether you're th you're thinking about it or not a lot of marketers that i interact with and a lot of executives that i interact with are thinking outside the box they're thinking about testing TikTok. they're thinking about starting their podcast they're thinking about doing an event weekly every day with or every week like i do but they don't actually do it yeah. and the a lot of the reason is because the company has created a framework inside of it that don't allow them to and that eventually comes back to the founders and the executives and so what i'm suggesting here is basically it's n it, do all the thinking great you can listen to my podcast and get a bunch of ideas you can come up with a bunch of ideas for yourself you can talk to your customers and get a bunch of ideas if you can't get that downstream to execution then it is a problem and that's generally what I see here. It's not about the ideas. It's about actually getting the ideas into production. Love it. And then I guess just before we wrap up, we've got five or six minutes before we wrap things up, Chris. It's been interesting. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are as to what we're going to see as the next evolution for marketing, because we've seen some pretty interesting changes over the last sort of 10, 15 years. I know everybody's talking about generative AI. I'm not convinced that's the next big thing for marketing, but in your view, what is? Like, it's crazy. You say we've seen marketing change so much over the past 10 years in B2B. I'd say it hasn't almost changed at all. It's like an entire perception, right? Okay, now we have 20 more tools to do the same shit more efficient. Like, we can do more of the same stuff that we did 10 years ago is basically all that's happened. When you think about, like, the future people reach to ai or we're gonna go and go on TikTok or things like that to me the thing that needs to change in b2b is how we actually make how we look at data and make strategic decisions that's what we need to change and and we have it up to this point and so that's where i'm focused as a professional and that's where my company is focused is how do we transition making strategic executive level go-to-market decisions Instead of making them based on experience and opinion, the VP of sales thought this way, or the CMO did this at their last company, so that's what we're going to do, and move it to science and data, where the entire company is, revolves around an objective data system, just like their P&L, where decisions can be made and people can understand them, and people can all be on the same page. That's the transition that needs to happen in marketing and go-to-market and B2B companies. It's not about AI. In the future, AI will be able to make that process a lot more efficient, but someone's got to create the process first. And, and like most of the AI use cases right now are about workflow efficiency, not about idea generation or, con or actual content creation, unless you want to make commodity stuff. And I think it's going to be like that for a while. And so to me, it's not about the channel. It's not about the technology. It's about the underlying system of how do the executives at our company think and what are the metrics and other ways that we score to understand what's working or what's not? Because the metrics drive everything that your team does. So 
that's and it's interesting like people have figured this out in the sales team comp plan you want salespeople to close deals earlier in the quarter pay them extra if they close a deal in month one or month two of the quarter instead of month three and all of a sudden what happens deals start closing earlier but we don't change any marketing metrics we haven't ever thought about a mark like a variable comp plan for marketing which is not something that i believe in necessarily but i'm just challenging the idea that we look at all these things and they perceive they're perceived to work in sales but we never consider them for marketing i'm just interested in challenging the status quo and trying to push the envelope and get people to look at things in different directions and consider unlearning some of the things that they've been taught over time and i think that i think that would be really helpful for a lot of executives and any level for that matter just being able to look at ideas and say, why do we do this? And I've been asking myself that for so long. Every time I see something that we're doing, like when we're gating content, when I was gating content in 2017, because a HubSpot blog told me to, because I would get more leads. And then I start doing it and I actually call those leads and they're like pissed at me that I called them. And I'm like, why do we do this? And then when you reverse engineer why we do it, you can start to figure out that it doesn't really, it doesn't really align with what buyers want today. No. And I think it's that real understanding of what people want that lets a lot of people down to your point. Exactly. We do things based on past experience and we forget that people are human beings and don't always act logically or very rarely act logically in all fairness. I really resonate with what you said about breaking the status quo down because I come at this from a background and I'm very proud that I've got no previous marketing background or sales background. I've learned everything in the last three years and it's been a it's been a really fun ride. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And there's lots more learning to be done. Somebody mentioned to me the other day that to be credible in my industry, I needed to have an accredited qualification. And I was like, no, my qualification is <laughs> I don't have qualifications because I'm not tied by traditional thinking and traditional ways of measuring things. And I like to break things, think outside the box. Awesome. Chris, it's been really interesting to chat. I guess like just before we go, have you got any last words for anyone? Who's listening along? Do you want to, how can people reach out to you, contact you if they want to know more? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. We, I'm sure we could have talked for two hours had we had the time, but I got to jump to another one. People that want to check out more about my thoughts, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Chris Walker171, or check out my podcast on all podcast platforms called B2B Revenue Vitals. Thanks all for being here. Hope it was valuable, and we'll talk to you again soon. 100%. It's been a pleasure, Chris. Thanks for your time.